Hi, I'm award-winning science educator and Black Friday Chris Hemsworth, Kyle Hill. You know we get up to a lot of crazy things here at the facility, and I'm always looking for new, totally not super villainy science-y ideas to science. That's why today's episode is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community centered around thousands of classes and courses that inspire creativity and creation. I just happened to finish science fiction and fantasy creating unique and powerful worlds by Lincoln Michelle, and the course helped me come up with no less than 12 new designs for lasers that only target people in Birkenstock sandals. Come on people, it's, it's 2020. If you want to try Skillshare like I did, the first thousand of you nerds to go down and click the link in the description, get a free trial of Skillshare Premium, and after that trial runs out, it's just $10 a month. You're welcome. Now let's see what we get up to on today's episode. I'm not wearing sandals. You can't prove that I'm not. Is it Tiva or Teva? Have you seen this one? Yes, mm-hmm. Oh, look, he's so small and wants chicken nuggets. Yes, Baby Yoda is so cute that he, I'm literally dying right now. Why is Mandalorian armor so good? Well, canonically in the Star Wars universe, we know that it's thanks to a material called Beskar which can deflect finger lasers, blaster bolts, and the occasional lightsaber. But what is it about the material itself, its properties, that allows for this? Well, I have some ideas. First- well, He's trying so hard to do the force, but he can't because he's so small. Yes, Baby Yoda is so cute, it puts Porgs and by extension, Ryan Johnson and his whole family to shame. Well, welcome to the facility. Now entering the facility. <laughs> hey, did you know that Baby Yoda's on the ISS now? So small! <laughs> if we want to know exactly why Mandalorian armor is so good, we must first understand what it's supposed to protect against. In the Star Wars universe, canonically, that's going to be yieldy blasters and the occasional lightsaber. These could be categorized as energy weapons, and energy weapons will damage or otherwise destroy a target through three damage modes. The first damage mode is overheating. Whether we're talking about lasers or plasma, energy weapons act to increase the surface temperature of their target. So with overheating, you could train a laser on something like a spaceship and eventually heat it up so much that all the systems, or at least the people inside, fail. The second damage mode is thermal shock. This is where something like a single blaster bolt heats up a surface so quickly and so violently that the surface evaporates, vaporizes, and more or less explodes. I think this is how most stormtroopers meet their end. The third and final damage mode is drilling. Sorry, not sorry. It's drilling. This is where multiple pulses from an energy weapon drill into or eventually all the way through a target. Now, whether we're talking about blasters or lightsabers, energy weapons are depositing energy into surfaces, and so therefore we can evaluate them with a scientific measure like energy per surface area. For example, it only takes around 10 kilojoules per square centimeter to kill a drone out of the sky with a big old Navy laser. <laughs> Look at that drone. That thing's flimsier than Qui-Gon Jinn's torso. <laughs> The most common weapon that a Mandalorian's armor will be protecting against is Ye Olde Blaster, an energy weapon that fires either lasers or plasma, depending on how wrong you want to be about it on the internet, at a target in single pulses, meaning that the damage mode of a blaster primarily is going to be that of thermal shock. Now, in a video I made a couple years ago that I guess I don't have access to for some reason, I explained why Thermal Shock does what it does to Stormtrooper armor, and in this case, Beskar is going to have all of the properties that that Stormtrooper armor does not have. So first and foremost, we could say that Beskar armor, in the language of human engineers, has an extremely high heat capacity. That it takes a lot of energy per unit mass to raise the best car just one degree. This would make it very hard for a single laser or plasma pulse to heat up the material, melt it, vaporize it, or otherwise destroy it. A good real world comparison for this, if we're gonna start making our own Mandalorian armor, would be something like boron carbide, which is a carbon ceramic, and it gets pretty close to what you might be considering as blaster proof. Another very important engineering and material property of Beskar would be a great thermal conductivity. Hmm. To the facility showers. <laughs> Let me ask you a weird question. Do you actually feel the temperature of stuff? 
I could tell you, sure, that this shower water feels warm, but I'm sure you've had this experience when you're in a nice hot shower, and then you step out onto the tile floor, and it feels freezing on your feet, and then you step onto the bath mat or the carpet, and it feels a lot warmer. Now, you would tell me that the carpet and the tile are two very different temperatures, but we know that they're not. They can't be. They're both at the exact same ambient temperature. So I ask you again, do you actually feel the temperature of stuff? Wow, there's a lot of air conditioner in here. <sighs> Based on simple yet powerful examples like this, I wouldn't say you ever really feel pure temperature. Rather, you feel the ability of some surface or environment to transmit heat energy to you or away from you. This is thermal conductivity. It's why a tile floor feels much colder than carpet in the same house, why you can put your hand in the air of a 500 degree oven and not get burned, but if you touch the sides, you will instantly be burned, and why even on a nice sunny warm day, a pool can still feel very, very chilly. If Mandalorian armor had a great thermal conductivity, then a blaster bolt would have a hard time doing damage to it, as the heat is rapidly dissipated away from what you're trying to vaporize or explode. So now we have two potential properties of Beskar, an extremely high heat capacity and thermal conductivity. The third property I want to look at is a bit shinier. To the facility makeup room. <laughs> Where do you think I keep all the argan oil, baby? You almost hit my hair with that laser bolt, Kevin. Are you, are you kidding me? In The Mandalorian, we see one, stormtroopers actually hitting their shots, and two, those shots bouncing off of Pedro Pascal's armor. If this is a property inherent to Beskar, then Beskar, in addition to everything else, must have a very high reflectivity for the wavelengths, the radiation coming out of this energy weapon, in this case, a blaster. This is equivalent to saying that the hand mirror you are looking at me through right now, it's cool, right? It's kind of like that shot from Contact, is very reflective of the wavelengths of visible light coming out from this laser pointer. It sounds simple, and that's because it is. Shiny armor would be better against laser-like weapons, at least much better than armor that is very matte or black or absorptive. And this kind of makes sense because Mandalorian armor is quite shiny. So, oh, the glasses. Oh, they're for protection from the wavelengths of laser pointer light here, even though it makes me look like Scott Summers from X-Men. Oh, my laser fired lake girlfriend blew me up. Oh, <laughs> the whole movie they made about her is bad. <laughs> There's one final way that Beskar can be the best armor, and that's the skill and the movement of the wearer, like Mando himself. So consider, for example, a continuous wave energy weapon like a solid laser beam, not a pulse. The longer it stays on a single spot, the hotter that spot gets, the more energy is deposited until burning and smoke and vaporization occurs, as you can see. But now, watch these moves. The more I move around, the harder it is for a single spot to get enough energy deposited on it to damage it or destroy it. Especially considering all the other properties of Beskar that we've postulated so far. I'm fine, I'm not even real. Making energy weapon attacks less effective through movement doesn't apply to individuals at just walking distance as much as it applies to giant spaceships and large scale battles where what I'm saying is yes, spinning would be a good trick, but Mando himself is quite mobile, and so even though it wouldn't help as much as all the other properties we've talked about for best car so far, it would do just a little bit and allow you to do stuff like this. Come on, baby Yoda. Let's go get some chicken nuggets. But Kyle, what about lightsabers? Best car is supposed to protect against glancing blows from lightsabers. <laughs> First of all, guy with the voice, I know. Second of all, even though lightsabers might pump out a lot more energy, have a lot more power than something like a blaster, many, many megawatts worth to cut through a blast door like this, all the properties that we talked about for best car so far, heat capacity, thermal conductivity, movement of the wearer of the armor, that would all help it here to be more lightsaber resistant than any other material has any business being. I don't know how to transition out of this scene because my doors are broken. 
Ari, could you cut the camera for a second? Kevin, I need this door fixed ASAP. Yeah, I am still mad about the hair thing. You almost hit it. It's all I have. I don't know. Do whatever the problematic aliens from episode one did to fix their blast doors when a space wizard with zero personality or likability cut through theirs. They seem to have it fixed. No, I do not want to watch that movie with you. It's, it's, it's awful. So what makes Best Car just so beast? Well, if I had to bet my engineering degree on it, which I definitely would not, it's a combination of high reflectivity, high heat capacity, high thermal conductivity, and the skill of the owner slash wearer. And this could easily explain the properties of this space iron or, or whatever John Favreau says it is these days. I can't keep track of canon. Look, there aren't a lot of good Star Wars sciency explanations out there. Trust me, I would know, but this, this is the way. Until next time. Oh, hey, you fixed the door. Do you like how I said the catchphrase? Yeah, those nerds eat it up. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for the direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. Today, especially, I want to recognize research assistant Trey Just and visiting scholar Bip Bip. Hey, that's fun and kind of Star Warsy. If you want to get on the facility staff, if you want to drape on your silky white lab coat and get behind the scenes images, talk with me on our Discord, get members only live streams, you can go to patreon.com slash kylehill and join the facility today. And if you support the facility just enough, get your name on Aria here each and every week. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of you. So I have no idea how I'm going to pass the time. Look, I, I would probably want really, really good armor too that predict that predicted against the you know most common weapons in the galaxy. If I had a very cool, admittedly, helmet that severely hampered my peripheral vision, that seems like a very bad idea. If fighting is your whole religion and stuff, you'd probably want a wide. I, I don't know. I haven't seen the Mandalorian yet. Is it good? Okay, fine. I'll go binge watch it right now. Just a second. Thanks for watching. I didn't watch it. I'm never gonna watch it.